Hey, welcome back. We've been talking through ideas about centripetal acceleration and friction and putting things together in various problems for physics and AP physics classes. And I want to talk today about how to deal with problems where you have a car on a flat road that turns in a circular path. And the question is, how can you solve for how fast a car can safely take a turn? Or what is the coefficient of friction where this car can safely turn? So these are tougher regular physics class problems or AP level problems. And let's go ahead and start thinking about it. So you could say we're going to start with a diagram of what's going on so you can more clearly see what's happening here, at least a badly drawn diagram. And there are really three major forces that we're focused on. So those are going to be the normal force, the gravitational force, and this is the force due to friction right here that allow the car to move in a circular path. And you could say, well, why is that? Why is friction heading inwards? And I do want you to think for a second about two concepts. One, there has to be a net force going towards the center to cause an object to be able to move in a circular path. There simply has to be. And secondly, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if the car was traveling and suddenly had no friction whatsoever? Like maybe they slammed in their brakes and their tires were just skidding across ice and they had no control over the car. And the answer is the car would just continue to move in a straight path. It will be an object in motion that will continue in that motion unless a net force acts on it, which is Newton's first law or the law of inertia. In other words, the inertia causes the car to just move in a straight line. What if the car does have friction? Well, then you can have the car move in a horizontal loop almost, in a big circle that you can think of as like a horizontal loop. So this is our simplified free body diagram. And we're going to start with the sum of the forces strategy. Let's start with the y-axis this time and think about what's happening here. So the sum of the forces strategy, I'll put a link to that in the upper right right about now. But that is where you just list out the forces, like literally the sum of the forces in that axis. So I've got an Fn and an Fg. Notice I'm making down implicitly negative. And then the second line for the sum of the forces is to say... The sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration in that axis, and that is Newton's second law right there. Then you set these two lines equal to each other, and you see what happens. I am also going to ask myself, well, what happens to my acceleration? It's appropriate to ask yourself, is this something or is this nothing? And in this case, this is nothing. In other words, the car is not accelerating in the y-axis at all. I'm also going to be plugging in mg for my force due to gravity. If you want to start that in the very beginning line, you can do that as well. Once you set these equal to each other, though, then you can continue to solve. And this proves that the magnitude of the normal force is equal to the magnitude of the weights. And we'll need that for friction. You could say, why are we even worrying about the y? And the answer is because friction deals with the normal force, and that's dealing with the y-axis. Now let's deal with the x. Let's think about what's going on in the x-axis. So we still have the same free body diagram. We're going to go ahead and say the sum of the forces in the x are equal to the sum of the forces. Well, there's just one, the force due to friction here. We're going to say that is equal to the mass times acceleration in that axis. Now, really important, we need to modify the strategy. Whenever we're talking about something moving in a circular path, we need to think about that and to say that acceleration is a special acceleration. The overall acceleration in that plane must be centripetal, and so that overall acceleration must be equal to one of two equations. You can do it either way. Whether you're using linear-based variables or rotation-based variables, you can do it either way. Now, that just depends on what the problem gives you. If it talks about omega right here and it's talking about a radians per second, then you would plug it in for acceleration over here. Or if it talks about tangential speed or talks about meters per seconds, then you would plug that in over here for the acceleration. So it just depends on the problem. If you haven't gotten to this yet into radian-based variables, you probably will later in your course. Just hang in there, sit tight, and know that there are two different ways to calculate centripetal acceleration. All right, so what we're going to do is plug both of those in. I'm going to show this in parallel so you can see what it would look like for both case scenarios. So this is our new equation for the linear based units, the new equation for the radian or rotation based units and variables. All right, so then we say, well, what can we do with that? We can go ahead and simplify what we have and start to think about how do we apply the work that we did previously? Well, the way that we apply that, both the x and the y depend on the friction equation. So that's where we're going to draw this in and apply the friction equation here. So the force due to friction, generally speaking, is going to be equal to mu times Fn. We could call this F sub S. I, at this point, I'm going to call it F sub F because 
for AP Physics C, they make no distinction between the kinetic friction force and the static friction force. All right, so we go ahead and sub in the values for what the force due to friction is equal to, and then we can go about and isolate for the speed at which this car can take a turn. So we're gonna solve for this over here, or we're gonna solve for this over here, depending on what type of units we have. So we're gonna to continue to isolate and simplify. We end up with this value for linear base variables, and we end up with this value for radian base variables. And so either way you do it, it's gonna to be totally solvable. So hopefully that's been helpful. I'm going over all of the major concepts in a regular physics class, as well as building up screencasts for every major topic in a AP Physics C mechanics course as well. So if you have any comments down below, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.